Let's start with a flashback to the second episode in the Cardboard House series. In this episode, I told you I had two dragon bodies that I had previously made, and I thought one of them would be perfect for the Cardboard House roof. The first one was an earth type dragon and the other one was a sea dragon and lots of people were excited about this so in this video i am going to show you how i am finishing this dragon and how you can make one for your own cardboard house and project if you would like to i decided not to go with the sea dragon because i had already sculpted its head arms, legs, and tail, and therefore I wouldn't be able to show you as much of the process, so the earth dragon is the one that got chosen for the cardboard house. I'll give you a quick peek at the final result now so you can decide whether this is a video that would be helpful for you. I really like how it turned out. I will put links below to a playlist that contains all my other dragon episodes that are on my channel, including this one, which is a live stream where I show you how to make the body from beginning to end. Unfortunately, that live stream has some bad audio, so I also do an overview, which will also be on that playlist, so you can decide which video is best for you. Those videos contain me using paper clay, but of course paper clay is not going to work for the dragon we're working on today because we are doing one for the cardboard house. And in the spirit of the cardboard house, we need to use household items. Paper clay, while very convenient and easy to create details, is not typically a household item. So I'm going to be using the same materials that I have been using on the house and the furniture that we have been building previously. Here is the earth dragon body that I'm going to be using today. It is just built up of aluminum foil, which I scrunched into shape, and then I covered everything in masking tape to make sure that it stays together. As you see, I have previously sculpted on here with paper clay. I thought about ripping it off, but I'm going to leave them on and then we can kind of compare and contrast uh, the paper clay legs with the non-paper clay legs. I will give you a quick hint um, if you want to create a sleeping dragon body. The best thing to do is to look up pictures of cats sleeping like on the back of a couch. Um, they give a really realistic looking pose that you can sculpt the body of your dragon off of so that it looks like it's relaxing on top of your roof. To start off, I'm going to take some corrugated cardboard. This is the cardboard that has the wavy pieces in between two layers. And I'm going to create different sized spikes that are going to go all down the back of my dragon. I'm going to be using hot glue as my main glue for this entire project until we get to the very end finishing the dragon. Hot glue works really quickly and grabs onto cardboard extremely well. The fun thing about dragons is you can really kind of make it however you want. So you can do bigger spikes or smaller spikes or no spikes or whatever you want to do. I'm now just reinforcing these spikes with a little bit of hot glue that goes from the cardboard onto the masking tape, just so there's less likeliness that I will knock it off while I'm working on it. Because I'm not using any clay in this process, I really need to use my materials that I have at hand, so my aluminum foil and masking tape, to build up the shapes I want. Because there's no clay to make the usual features that I am used to creating on these dragons. I wanted to have kind of an underbite look for his face, so I'm taking some aluminum foil and I'm folding it into a rectangle shape and then scrunching it, and this is going to be his lower jaw. I'm going to carefully glue it on with some hot glue, and then once that is in place, I'm just gonna take some masking tape and go over it so that the edges are just a little bit smoother as they're attached to the dragon. I'm going to have to do the same thing for any other features. If I want the eyes to protrude a little bit, I'm going to have to um, roll up foil like I did here. I made just a little ball of foil and then scrunched it into a disc shape. I'm going to first attach that with hot glue and then later I'll go over it with foil. I also decided I wanted to do an eyelid shape over the whole thing so he didn't end up looking so bug-eyed. 
The nice thing about working with aluminum foil is you really can kind of squish it into any shape you want. Just be careful because it can cause cuts on your hands. I have found that the cheap aluminum foil that you can get at bargain stores is actually the best foil you can use for this. The higher end thicker foil tends to cut my hands up just a little bit more. I'm now going over each eye with masking tape just to smooth it down a little bit. I decided I wanted to add some horns to his head, so I cut out some shapes out of cardboard. This is going to make sure that I don't accidentally bend or really mess them up if they were just pure aluminum foil, but I'm still going to wrap them in aluminum foil to give them a little bit more of a rounded shape so that it's just a little bit different from the spikes he has on his back. And I'm just going to put them wherever I like. Um, like I said, he's a dragon, so you can just kind of have fun with the shapes. Now it's on to putting the scales onto the dragon. And you may recognize this technique from the doghouse. I'm basically going to be shingling this dragon. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult because it's an organic shape instead of just a flat roof, but I will show you some tips and tricks I picked up along the way. The first trick is to soak this material in water. The material I have here is chipboard. This is actually from a drink carrier from a fast food place, but you can also get chipboard from other food type um, packaging like cereal boxes. It's what we've been using in the cardboard house. It's cardboard, but it doesn't have the corrugation in the center. I'm going to be using hot glue to glue down the soaked pieces. The reason I soak them is so that they're more pliable and it will be easier to bend them to the shape of the dragon's body. I was a little concerned that hot glue would not work on wet material. I thought maybe the water would not let it stick, but it really did, which became such a convenient thing. I was so glad that worked because the hot glue takes hold incredibly quickly and I don't feel like I have to sit there holding down glue forever. Wetting the chipboard material is really what made this all possible. It is very difficult to form this around a cylindrical tail like this if the board is not completely soaked with water. I also did try and get as much water off before I applied it to the dragon. I don't know if I mentioned that, but um, you don't want it dripping. You just want the board wet so that you can form it fairly easily. I'm going to be starting at the back of the dragon and working my way forward, similar to a roof, because I want the next layer to cover the previous scales or shingles. <laughs> I guess scales are kind of like shingles. Um, and you just want to keep going forward towards the front of the dragon, adding more layers on top that cover the previous layer. You may have noticed I'm starting with one end of the scales at the back part or the uh, where the spikes are on the back of the dragon and then I'm wrapping it underneath the tail. As I go forward from this point, I am only going to be working on one side of the dragon at a time and I'm not really worrying about putting scales on his underside. Of course, if you would like to do that, you definitely can. I just knew that his underside wouldn't be seen and so I just kind of worried about the sides and so the scales do not completely go underneath his belly. As I go around the leg, I'm going to start cutting the scales to fit. I am going to do the leg completely separate from the main torso. I'm also going to be cutting into some of the shapes of the scales themselves. And so I just wanna get as close of a fit as I can. As you can see, these two scales are cut a little shorter and this is because they are going to go around the front hip part of the leg. I will be honest, this is quite a tedious process. One of those where I always suggest just put on a movie or a show you wanna binge watch, sit down and shingle scale your dragon. This is how it looks once I'm done with the main torso. I did the same thing around the front arms, I just carefully cut the pieces so that they fit and then I ended right above the shoulder area before I got to the neck. 
I also made sure to do the other side as well. I didn't worry too much about trying to make all of the scales match up like on both sides of the body because he is laying at a weird angle. Um, I think it's okay if they're not completely in straight lines. I'm now going to do the neck very similarly to the way I did the tail. I'm going to wrap it all the way around. I did start with this piece and noticed that I could get it around his one spike that's on his neck. So I cut a little gap in between the scales. I put them into the water, added some hot glue, and then put the scales around the spikes. So you could do this technique all the way around if you didn't want that little gap that you can see wherever my scales are, but I am going to be filling that in later, so that's why I'm not really worrying about it at this point. Here you can see how the first neck piece is going. I like to go all the way around the neck because usually you can see underneath the neck part. At this point, I'm going to start using single scales instead of a long strip of scales to go around and in between the horns of the dragon. You can decide if you want to scale the entire face. I typically like to have a bit of the face sticking out and not completely scaled. I'm also going to be using little strips of this same chipboard to create some uh, what do they call it? eye socket bones? <laughs> Something to just define his eyes a little bit. And then I continued the next scales to right behind those eye socket bone details. And don't worry about these pieces up here because when we do the joint compound, it will fill in that and it will look like one smooth piece. So now we're going to move on to working on the legs and the arms and they are actually probably a little bit easier than the body, at least they went faster for me. I'm using individual scales for this, so I'm just cutting quite a few, putting them in water. I'm not doing like hundreds and leaving them in the water because I'm not sure if they'll come apart, but maybe, you know, 15 to 20 scales, let them soak in the water while you're working, and then this goes a little bit faster. I do like to leave some of the foot or hand sticking out a little bit underneath the scales. So I'm starting my scales at about the ankle um, and this kind of matches with the head sticking out of the scales a little bit too. Like I said, you can do scales all the way down. You can actually do no scales if you want to do no scales, but um, it's just kind of up to what you want to do. I started by laying out my first row at the ankle height and then I'm doing my next row up and then I will continue going all the way to the top of the hip. When I get to this point, this is kind of a tricky joint area. So what I'm gonna do is add some hot glue and the flat part of one of the scales and I'm gonna leave it sticking up while the hot glue dries. I'm not gonna lay it down yet. I'm gonna leave it right there. And then once it's dry, I'm going to fold it over. And when I fold this one over, I realize that I actually need one more scale on this leg. You know, this is a little bit of trial and error. Every dragon is going to be a completely different shape. I add one more little scale on there. And now I know that my top scale is going to bend over the top of the thigh and it's going to be able to cover the rest of the leg. I'm going to add some more scales in a similar fashion where I'm letting the hot glue dry while they are sticking straight up. And once the hot glue is completely dry, I can go through and add more hot glue and then force them to fold down over the top of the thigh. This will hide the top of the other scales and make a continuous smooth transition from the leg to the torso of the body. And this is how it's looking. I actually like how this came out. I do decide to do a different transition for the arm area that's a little bit more subtle, but because there was such a deep valley on the hip, I decided to do that first transition. This one is going to be shingled from the back of the arm over the, I guess, the shoulder. And so all I'm doing is adding shingles that are going in the same direction. I'm saying shingles instead of scales. <laughs> it, they're just going to be interchangeable in this video, I think. I'm adding scales that go from the back of the shoulder up over the shoulder and around to the front that go in the same direction as the scales that are on the body. So this still 
denotes where the arm is, but it's a little bit more subtle. So depending on how your dragon is laying or standing, either one of these will definitely work to show transition between the body and the different appendages. So now the body is completely covered in scales and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. I did decide to try and add some like claws to the hands and the one back foot that's on the other side of the dragon and this process didn't work out super well. Um, later on you'll see that these little talons I try to glue on fall off. I do come up with a different solution for that later. Um, it's just difficult to try and add some of these little details that are a little bit simpler with working with some kind of clay. Once all the scales are dry, I'm going to go back and fill in some of the gaps with joint compound, which is the same material that I had used on the furniture and the cardboard house. I'm using this little sculpting tool and I'm going to be filling in the corrugation and any gaps I don't want to be seen on the dragon before I put the final mixture on top of it. And I'm going to be smoothing out the head. This is going to be a very important process. I am going to be doing this compound smoothing and sanding process on the head and the front right arm, but not the back arm and leg, and you will see the difference for sure. One of the things I'm doing is trying to get as smooth a coat uh, as possible of the joint compound on the face and hand. It is going to look a little rough. You're not going to be able to get it completely smooth. But the good thing about this joint compound is it's incredibly easy to sand. I let the first layer of joint compound dry and then took a rough grit sandpaper and went over the whole thing trying to make it as smooth as possible. You can kind of carve into it a little bit, but you do run the risk of it cracking. It is kind of a brittle substance. It's meant to go in between drywall panels, not really to be sculpted with. This is going to make quite a bit of dust because it is fairly soft material while you're sanding it, so just make sure to be careful with that. You can also go back and sand over some of the spikes on the back, especially if you felt like you made kind of a mess with the joint compound. It is just easy to sand off any high spots and make them just a little bit more smooth. And then we can be ready for the second coat of drywall compound. And this I am working really hard to get as smooth as possible with the sculpting knife. This time's a little bit easier because I am applying it to a smoother surface. I do only end up doing this two layers of drywall compound. Um, so I do this twice, but you can probably do this three or four times depending how smooth you want your drywall compound to be before moving on to the next step. Also make sure to let each layer dry completely before the next layer that's incredibly important. I did try to sculpt some of the facial features into the drywall compound. It did not work well, so instead I was thinking I could possibly add some details with hot glue. And at this point, the little talons on the fingers had fallen off and I had purposely taken the nose spike off. I just decided that I didn't like it, um, but I left the horns on. So these are just kind of the thoughts that were running through my head at this point. I'd never done this before, so this was all kind of an experiment. My idea of adding the hot glue details worked pretty well. Um, of course, you're kind of limited on the details you can make because hot glue just kind of makes either a blob or a line blob. Um, but I did make little toenails and then I used a line of hot glue to make the upper lip line on the face. And it is a little bit jaggedy, uh, but I do kind of use that in my design later. 
Now I'm going to create the mixture that I have made several times during this cardboard house process. It is going to be the same joint compound that we used before and I'm going to also use some PVA glue. I'm using Elmer's School Glue. You're going to use it in a one-to-one -one part mixture and I'm just going to mix them together. If you want it to be a little bit stiffer, you can add a little bit more of the joint compound. If you want it to be a little bit more liquidy, add a little bit more of the glue. I'm now using an old brush that I don't really care about anymore. It's been through a lot. And I'm going to apply the compound and I'm going in the opposite direction of the scales. This is because I want some of that mixture to get up underneath the scales. Because it has glue in it, it's just going to make sure that those scales better adhere to each other and create a solid form of the body. Before you do this step, make sure every previous step you have done is dry. You want to make sure you're not trapping any mixture underneath this final coat. I do end up doing two layers of this mixture that I've created, making sure that each layer dries before I add another layer. Again, you can do more than two layers if you like to, um, but I just found that two layers was good enough for what I wanted it to look like. I'm working on the top half of the dragon first, making sure that I'm happy with its coverage, both, um, both layers of the mixture. And you can definitely see the difference between doing the drywall and sanding step versus not doing it. This is just the compound on top of aluminum foil. So the back hand and foot look a little more crumply, like basically aluminum foil looks. So um, that does definitely show that the drywall compound and sanding step helps with the smoothness quite a bit. I'm going to use the mixture again now on the bottom of the dragon and then let that dry completely. I did two layers on the underside as well. Now I'm going to sand again. I know this, <laughs> this whole project includes a lot of sanding. Sanding is never my favorite step, but it does help a lot in this process. You will notice that quite a bit less dust is coming off this time. That is because the glue is mixed into that mixture and it makes it a much tougher shell and you won't be able to scratch or poke at the surface like you would the drywall compound. Now for the exciting painting part, I decided to do a green dragon with some turquoise highlights. So the first layer, I'm just going to cover the entire dragon in this green color, which is actually a custom mixed green color of all my leftover green paints. It's Aira's avi avocado avocado, I think is what we named it in one of my live streams. Uh, but I really like this color for the dragon. And um, then I decided to go with some turquoise accents. And those are going to be on basically the ends of the arms, the ends of the face, the horns, at the ends of the scales. And I'm going to try to blend that into the green. And as I've said all along, dragons are fun because really they can be any color. They could be black, they could be a bright gold, they could be red, they could be iridescent like the dragon I created for my other project, and you can really just have fun. I ended up going with a darker green for the belly and then kind of blending that up the side of the dragon. I felt like this gave it a little bit of a shading without using actual black because it looks like it's getting darker at the belly or any place that is kind of the underside of the dragon. And then where the hip joint hits the body, I made sure to dry brush some of that dark green in those areas. This is just to give a little bit more definition in those parts of the dragon's body. I went ahead and dry brushed some of the same dark green over the scales. And now, because I just can't help myself, <laughs> I am using a brown paint wash. This is just water mixed with a little bit of brown acrylic paint. And I'm putting that over the entire dragon just to give him a little bit more of an earthy or aged tone to give him just, uh, yeah, a little bit more age. <laughs> I, I have to age everything, even if it's supposed to be something that's alive. It's got to be a little bit of aging, a little bit of, um, of grime kind of built up in between those scales. 
and then I'm going to make sure that that layer dries completely before moving to the next part. This is where I'm going to be adding some details into the face. I did push into my uh, form into the aluminum foil and created the two little nostrils that are very not straight, but that's okay. I think it adds a little bit to the charm. And then I'm adding some black in the mouth line just to make it look like there is a line there. And um, then I'm also going to make one little stroke underneath the eye because I want this dragon to look like it is sleeping and the eyelid is closed. I didn't want to mess with this line too much, just keep it pretty simple. I did add just a couple little eyelashes at the end and then tried my best to do the same thing on the other side to try and keep the eyes as even as possible. And this is how the face is looking. Oh, and then I did go back and added just a couple wrinkles to the lips. I told you that my hot glue line wasn't super straight and it was kind of lumpy. So I tried to make it look as though the lips were themselves supposed to look like they were just a little bit lumpy and a little wrinkly. Now I'm using some shaved chalk pastel and I'm using the black shaved chalk pastel. I just shave it down with a blade into these little pots and I feel like I can get some better coverage of the color if I use it like this instead of trying to get it straight off of the chalk pastel stick. This step is definitely not necessary, but it does help add a little bit more depth and dimension to the body parts. And it does look like the arm is more separated from the body as if there is definitely like a dragon armpit there, <laughs> I guess. And then I went and defined the area where the spikes are because that was kind of blending into the body so i just added some black pastel there and then into the back of the eye socket i wish i had done a little bit less chalk pastel there but um i think it definitely helped define the area of the eye I don't show it here, but I also added a little bit of the chalk pastel to where the scales meet the arms and legs and tail. And then I made sure to seal it with a matte sealant or a matte coating. You don't have to do this. They probably will stay on the dragon if you don't, but they may come off on your hands. I also made wings for this dragon using the same steps as Miss Periwinkle's wings. So I will also link her video below if you want to check out how I made those wings. They're made from pipe cleaners and toilet paper and water and glue. So super simple, but I think they're pretty effective. And because this is made out of just simple materials, it's really easy to just drill into the dragon. I'm putting the hole right where the shoulder blade area would be. I think that's probably where like the muscles would be that would be controlling the wings. And then I cut off the pipe cleaners so that they were the right length and then inserted them into the holes and added some glue. I definitely prefer these dragon wings over my original ones uh, where I used masking tape. I like that these are just a little bit see-through. I think they make them just, it just makes them a little bit more magical, I think, in my personal opinion. They are bright blue in this video. I do end up aging them just to match the dragon's body a little bit. I add some watered down green and some watered down brown that are the same exact colors that I added to the body. And here is how our cardboard dragon is looking, mostly made from household materials, the same things we made the cardboard house from, um, except for a foot and a tail made with paper clay. Here's my original paper clay dragon, which again is in the playlist below. If you would prefer to work with paper clay, I have a video that goes over that. Um, but honestly, I think they look pretty comparable. I think the only thing that would probably give away that the cardboard dragon is not made from clay would be the hands, which were definitely more difficult to sculpt. Paper clay makes that so much easier, and it was definitely easier on the original dragon to get those tiny details. But all in all, I'm pretty happy. So I think it's time to put him up onto the cardboard house. He's definitely going to need a name. 
Miss Periwinkle is the fairy that we made to live inside the house, so he'll need a name that's just as fun and whimsical as Miss Periwinkle's. So make sure to leave your suggestions in the comments below. Here he is resting on the roof right next to the tower that he may or may not have been responsible for destroying. And I also turned the house around to the side where it's open and he does fit pretty well there um, with his little foot and his tail hanging down into the opening of the house. So that's it for today's creation. I hope you really enjoyed the cardboard dragon. And I do have one more little member of the family we need to create. Actually, I already created him, but I'm running out of time in this video, so I will have to show him to you in the next one. I hope you all have an amazing week, and I'll see you later. Bye!